In the Victorian era, Britain changed as never before. It was the time of great inventors, great engineers, but above all, great businessmen, entrepreneurs. And one of the best examples was the pioneer photographer, Francis Frith. It was in the 1860s that Francis Frith embarked upon a monumental mission using the newly invented photographic camera. He wanted to document every city, every town, and every village in the land. I'm tracing the footsteps of this remarkable man and his team of photographers. Using their pictures as my guide, I'll be traveling the length and breadth of the country, finding out what has altered and what has stayed the same. And along the way, I'll be taking my own photos to try and capture the mood of the place as it is now. That's great. Welcome to Britain's first photo album. The old photographers not only portrayed the world in a new way never done before, they made people want to go to the places where the photographers had been to. The old photos encouraged tourism, but also a great new interest in history. And that was particularly true here in Scotland. Today, my photographic tour takes me from the Western Highlands of Perthshire to the city of Stirling and down to the famous Forth Canal. I'll be making a meal of classic Scottish oat cakes. <laughs> Ta-da! Finding out how to take a picture, as Frith did over a hundred years ago. I've taken mine ages ago. We have to wait now. 30 seconds. And, of course, adding to my own album of photographs. It is the old and the modern, I hope, brought together in one picture. Today I've come to the most northerly point of my travels, to the Trossachs National Park in Scotland and the beautiful freshwater Loch Catrin. In 1873, this area was opened up for the first time by train with the establishment of the Callander to Oban Railway. It brought in tourists in their droves and attracted the Frith photographers looking to sell their memento pictures. This one is of a steam-powered boat on one of the most picturesque of Scottish lochs. The boat was called the Rob Roy, after Sir Walter Scott's famous novel. So, have things changed since the photo was taken? Not a bit of it. This is a sort of romantic scene which Victorian travellers loved. And Loch Catrin is not just any old lake. It's the setting for a famous poem, The Lady of the Lake. It was written by one of the most popular writers of the 19th century, Sir Walter Scott. But you've got to imagine for this that this is a beautiful summer's day. The wanderer's eye could barely view the summer heaven's delicious blue. So wondrous wild the whole might seem the scenery of a fairy dream. In Victorian times, people just really went for that sort of poem. And they came to this place from all over Scotland, but also from all over Britain, because they wanted to capture the spirit of that lady of the lake. And since 1843, the Loch Catrin passenger steamers have been taking those well-to-do visitors on romantic tours of the Highlands. The Rob Roy in the Frith picture was decommissioned shortly after the photo was taken. The steamer we see today is the Walter Scott. Louise Corrieri is one of the current crew, and she's made a special study of this area. Right, now you're going to tell me where this photograph was taken. Yes, I think it's on the rock face um, just in front of us. So it's sort of this so. bit is right, isn't it? So. I think so, around about this area, yeah. OK, we're getting the idea, aren't we? Yeah. So this photograph was taken when? Um, roughly around 1898. Yeah. And when did the Sir Walter Scott, the ship we can see, when did that first come onto the lake? Um, she had her first official season in 1900. Right, so it's only two years after that. Yes. And that's the actual boat that we can see. Yes, it is. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's Louise's job to make sure that tourists enjoy the lock tours as much as they did in Victorian times. How much do you mention Sir Walter Scott? We've got an island coming up shortly, um, 
and that's where he used to sit to write his poems. So we we tell them about the Lady of the Lake, and it's just to point out the scenery to yeah. say this is why he was so inspired. Um, yeah. Even on a day like today, it's so mysterious and romantic. It, it's never a horrible place. It always looks stunning. It doesn't yeah. matter what the weather is. In any case, the good holiday maker is always determined to enjoy their holiday, come rain or shine. Right, are you enjoying the trip? We are, it's lovely, yeah, it's really nice. And, and what do you like about it? It's just so beautiful and, and scenic around here. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's a really pretty part of Scotland. And people say it's romantic. Do you think it's romantic? It is, but um, I think the, the, the rain has dampened the romance maybe has a it? little bit today. Yes, it's, it's a bit sure. bleak. <laughs> no, I think you get the mist, you get it the full is, effect. It is, actually, yes, it is yeah. actually very lovely, really lovely. Where are you from? Nottingham. Are you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Robin Hood would have liked this, wouldn't he? Oh, he would definitely. have loved it. <laughs> yes, I think he and Rob Roy would have been good mates. <laughs> the steam engine in the boat at the time of Frith's picture would have been state-of-the-art, the only way to power such a large vessel across the loch. Nowadays, the steam engines in the Walter Scott provide nostalgia as well as power. I went down to the engine room to meet the chief engineer, Malcolm Stylek, to learn its secrets. Originally, it was run by coal, wasn't it? Yes. And how did it work? OK, originally the coal boilers were situated in the same place as these oil-fired boilers are now. Right. It's now running on biofuel, which is basically vegetable oil. Oh, really? Yes. Right. The steam comes down this pipe here into the regulator, where we control the speed of the engine, and then it's used three times through the engine. That's why it's called a triple expansion steam engine. And how old is this? This is 112 years old. It was built in 1899. Over the years, the bearings have had to be replaced, obviously, the wearing parts, but fundamentally, it's as it was in 1899. And does it ever go wrong? Uh, not on my watch. No, no. no, certainly not. <laughs> what a lovely boat, and what a gentle way to see this glorious scenery. When it comes to taking a photo of the place, I feel at one with the Frith photographer of all those years ago. Right, this is my attempt now at a romantic picture. The rain's always been here, but the rain, I think, adds to it. I think it gives it that air, certainly the mist does makes it just a slightly bit more mysterious and interesting. <laughs> 112 years old. What a lovely boat. I'm a bit soft on boats, I admit. But the autumn colours, haven't they come through well? And of course, the subject matter. She is the true Lady of the Lake. In the mid-19th century, large numbers of tourists were coming to the Western Highlands for the first time. They stopped off at small towns en route, and my next port of call is one such town, Callender, which lies about 10 miles east of the loch. The Frith picture is of the High Street in Callender, which was flourishing with all that extra trade the visitors brought. Souvenir shops, hotels and cafes were springing up to cater for the growing demand. We could do with better weather, but this is a rather genteel resort which the Frith photographers came to and they took a nice picture of the main high street where we're going and it's virtually exactly the same as it was. In fact, the tourist trade is still going strong in Calendar all these years later. Local historian and businessman Rob Kerr works in the High Street, and he's pretty sure he can show me where the Frith picture was taken. So we turn this way slightly. Yeah. And probably the most, the most prominent thing on the High Street that you can see here at the bottom is the Dreadnought Hotel, which still stands to this day, and it's recently had a, a, a facelift and renovation. So I think to, to get the real essence of where the photograph begins, I think yeah. we have to head up the main street slightly. It does look surprisingly similar. It is. the street today, yes. isn't it? Well, recently they've spent a lot of money, um, lottery-funded money, keeping the, the, the facings of the buildings looking the same. 
The buildings here have been restored to their former glory, and apart from the obvious addition of cars, this view has changed very little since Frith's time. We're about here, John, if we have a look at the photograph now. All right. And if we take a look down the main street, we can see this is approximately where the person would have been standing that shot the photograph in those, yeah. those um, times. But calendar's very much, um, it's maintained the facing. I suppose, looking at this photograph here, the only thing that we can really notice straight away that's changed is perhaps the clothing of the people sure. and, uh, and the introduction of tarmac on the roads. Yeah. Um, but the main, the main photograph content has remained the same. And uh, we still, you know, very fortunately have some of the, uh, the old buildings um, still being used for what they were used for in those days. Yeah. For example, the hotels and guest houses. The bakery that Rob runs has been on Calendar High Street for over 100 years and would have been selling bread, cakes and pies when the Frith picture was taken. It's still making traditional pies and old Scottish classics, oat cakes and bridies. I can't resist trying my hand at a bit of baking, and Rob is going to give me an oat cake challenge. I've got to make these, have I? Yeah, we're going to show you. We're going to try to show you. I don't know whether you can make them or not, John, but um, we'll certainly give it a go. But they're meant to be very simple, aren't they? They are very simple. That was the reason the oat cake came about, because it was very cheap, very, very affordable for the families to make in the you know, days gone by. So, here I go, then. This should be a breeze. You don't want to have too much whiskey before you do this, do you? So... Next, to add an ingredient which I'm sure is not traditional for a Scottish recipe. And I've done this one for you, John, so... Really? All of that oil there, that's some uh, olive oil. 250 grams of that, so... Right, you some want nice Scottish in. olive oil. Yes, uh -huh. right, comes from the Highlands. From the Highlands. <laughs> it pressed, <laughs> pressed in the Highlands, yes. right. After a good old stir, it's time to get stuck in. Just give it a little dusting. Can I try that? You can give that a go. Just give it a good throw on there. Well done. You've done that before, haven't you? <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> OK, so if you want to tip out your mix onto the table... Oh, right. Get it all out there. I never realised so much work went into such a small oat cake. The whole process has to be done with a bit of a flourish to stop things falling off trees and also knocking into people because we actually carry it just above our heads like so. Oh, right, shouldn't I do that? Yep, so just pop it down. It's quite tricky, isn't it, right? There you go, you look okay. like a baker now. Into the oven they go, and 15 minutes later, hey presto, they're done. Well, look at that. Yeah. And look at those oat cakes. Well, they look terrific. I'm pretty pleased with the result. But when it comes Hello. to baking, it's the customer Hello. who's always right. I have to throw myself onto the mercy of the local calendar food critics. <laughs> now, what do you think? Very nice. There you go. Very nice. What can I say? Well, one thing is for sure, Scottish baking is alive and well in calendar, just as it was when the Frith photograph was taken. My photo will celebrate traditional pastries. OK. Right, are you ready? Ready. And what we want here, your motivation is pride, right? Pride in pies. Here's my picture of the proud purveyor of perfect pies. We did have a choice for my picture, but there's no point in taking the road again, because it's exactly the same, the high street. But what about those pies? Brides, haggis, steak with black pudding. I mean, just read out those names. You want to eat them, don't you? I certainly do. I'm telling the story of Britain's first photo album, tracing the footsteps of Francis Frith and his team, using the photographs they took to show how life has changed. For the next stop on the Scottish leg of my tour, I'm heading across Perthshire and east to the city of Stirling. Our next Frith photo is of the Great Hall at Stirling Castle, one of Scotland's most important military fortifications. The castle sits atop a crag, surrounded on three sides by steep cliffs, a strong defensive position. And with its strategic importance on the bank of the River Forth, Stirling became one of the key cities in Scotland. 
This is one of the greatest of all the castles in Britain, and the Frith photographers had a field day rushing about taking pictures of the dramatic exteriors. But the photograph that we've got is not very striking, but it is extremely interesting. The Great Hall at Stirling Castle is one of the first examples of Renaissance-influenced royal architecture in Scotland. However, by the time of the Frith photo, many of its original features, including the roof and stained glass windows, had been removed in order to convert it into military barracks. In black and white, the place looks a mere shadow of its former self. But just look at it now, in full technicolour. What an incredible transformation. The striking peachy tones of the hall make it stand out from the rest of the castle. In fact, it looks almost new. Gary Darcy's been the senior steward here for 13 years. He tells me why the Great Hall has changed since the Frith photo. This photograph was taken when the Great Hall was a barracks. Uh, it was in use by the army uh, between 1790 and 1964. Where this picture has, has captured the Great Hall, or the old parliament building as they called it, is in the middle of its life cycle. This building started out looking as it does today. When they left the, the, the castle in 1964, a restoration project began to restore it back to the way it originally looked. We're looking at something from which century? The, the building was built in 1503. Right. And for a hundred years it bore witness to feasts, banquets and two sessions of the Scottish Parliament. And why does it have this, well, this lovely colour? <laughs> the covering is called harling. It's a thick layer of lime plaster that's applied to the outside of the building. It acts like a waterproofing, but it was also there to make the building stand out. Now, when the Frith photographer was taking this, it didn't look anything like no. that. Why do you think they wanted this photograph to go out? They titled the photograph the Old Parliament Building, and I really think that what they were doing was connecting the, the, the history, the, the governing of Scotland, and, and pulling that and showing people that this is where Parliament used to sit. The Great Hall is now a favourite for visitors to Stirling Castle, and I'm sure Frith and his team would have been taken by its new, old look. When the Frith team came here to take their picture, they would have been burdened with a much more laborious photographic process than we use today. We have small digital cameras. Frith travelled around with a cartload of gear. Alex Boyd is a historical photographer, and he's come to Stirling to demonstrate what Victorian photography entailed. Now then, you're going to tell me just how difficult it was to take this picture. Yes, I mean, aside from having to carry the weight of that, it would have been quite cumbersome. Um, but as you can see, the camera uh, is quite basic. It's um, pretty much the same camera that uh, Mr Frith would have used right. when he was making his images, yes. Right, and it's a bellows camera. That's right, it's a bellows extension, so it's fixed at the front, but if you want to focus, you actually have to move the whole camera. The lens itself is an original. It would have been the same type of lens that Francis Frith would have used. Um, it's from the 1870s, 1880s. Right. Um, yeah, so that's the actual only part of the camera which is original, but it will the same results. And how would it work? Uh, well, it's much more simple than digital cameras. Um, basically, you cover uh, the lens when you want to stop or start the exposure, and that's it, basically. You know, it's um, you expose onto the film um, and then close it once, you, once you're finished. Why are you wearing rubber gloves? Ah, uh, yes, uh, a lot of people ask that. Um, the difference between modern and um, the Victorian photography has used a lot of chemicals and they're quite hazardous in some cases, uh, such as silver bromide, and if um, you get it on your skin, it will actually stain your hand black. What would the photographer be able to see? And what would you uh, be yes. able to... Can you well, show me that? Yes. Right, OK. If you look under it... You can see that? Yeah, I can see that. That's actually quite clear. And as you can see, John, one of the features of uh, the Victorian camera is it does actually reverse the image, making it upside down and reversing the actual picture plane. How very confusing. Yes, I know, I know. All right, so you're going to work under tremendous difficulties. Indeed, yes. Uh, you're going to try That's right, yes. and take this photograph. Yes, something similar. Using the old camera. Yes. Where do you think this photograph was taken? Well, actually, I don't believe the picture was taken here. I think it was taken in a much more awkward location, which right. was the back uh, on the battlements. Heading up to our vantage point, Alex and I can now get a view of the castle just as Frith did. We're going head to head. Alex with his Victorian camera and me with my modern one to see who gets the shot first. I sense I'm in with a chance here. Are you ready? I'm ready, yes. OK, and we're going to time it, aren't yes, we? Yes, indeed, 30 seconds it's going to take me, so... OK, off you go. OK.
I'd taken mine ages ago. We have to wait now. 30 seconds. But they would have taken, I mean, I understand that sometimes the whole process would have taken about six hours. That's right, yes. I mean, well, at least uh, we've done that now. OK. Well done. Thank you. Alex develops the image on the glass plate in his makeshift darkroom. He fixes the image using potassium cyanide. Turning the glass plate around, the image appears the right way up. From setting up his camera to producing the negative plate has taken Alex the best part of an hour. I took my photo in less than a second. For Alex to get a black and white print, the glass plate would eventually be laid onto specially coated paper. But that would have to be done elsewhere. What a long, drawn-out business. Now then, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to press a button, and it might work. It was interesting to see how Frith would have taken his pictures, but it's so much easier now. The advantage of taking the same photograph as Frith did is we can see how much work went into this and how much expertise in the technology of the time. And it makes you really appreciate the Frith photographer and his skill when you compare it with this. This is not the same. He's had to work really hard. I pressed a button, but it still makes me proud of my picture. For our last Frith photograph today, we don't have to travel far. The picture is of Stirling Bridge, for centuries a key crossing point over the River Forth, and once an important customs bridge. Taxes on goods and livestock were collected here. I'm heading to the spot where Frith's picture was taken to meet local historian John Harrison. He knows how strategically important the bridge was to Scotland in the past. So why is it so important to cross at this point? Because the river is tidal, this is the lowest possible bridging point. Um, you have ferocious currents going up and down here, and if you want to get a medieval army across this river, then you need a bridge. If there's any army that's coming either from or to the highlands of Scotland, the chances are they've got to cross this bridge. Exactly. And yeah. th there were alternatives, but they were more difficult, and this would always be your favoured option. The most famous battle here was the Battle of Stirling Bridge, wasn't it? Indeed, yeah. In 1297, um, an English army attempting to reassert English control in Scotland foolishly crossed the bridge. From this side? From this side to the north side. Um, the Scots sweep down, the English were cut off, they were unable to defend themselves, um, and the English were defeated by the army of William Wallace. So why do you think the Frith photographer took this particular picture? It was an important historic bridge, and people are coming to Stirling largely because of its ancient history. Um, they'll be aware of the Battle of Stirling Bridge and the other military significance of Stirling. They want to see that, and of course it's an, impo an interesting structure as well. The stone Stirling Bridge that stands here today was built in the 15th century and remains an impressive architectural structure. The tidal, fast-running River Forth has always set challenges for Scottish engineers. Even to this day, experts have been wrestling with new ideas of getting people to and fro along the waterways and coming up with some radical ideas. The Victorian period was a boom time for Scottish engineers. They had plenty of self-confidence and lots of projects. Nowadays, there aren't so many opportunities, but every now and then you come across a terrific example of Scottish engineering design, and we're going to one of them. If you travel a short distance from Stirling Bridge, you will find the Falkirk Wheel, a rotating boat lift which connects two canals between the Forth and Clyde rivers. It opened in 2002 and replaced a series of 11 locks that previously connected the waterways. Falkirk wheel mechanic Phil Martin is enthusiastic about its radical design. How exactly does it work? Well, what you can see there is an aqueduct which is full of water and the boats will come along the aqueduct to this dead end. So we have to get the boat from that top canal down onto this, this basin here. And how high is that? That's about 30 metres high. It's a wheel 
that has a gondola, which you can see at the top, and another one at the bottom, and the boat moves into that gondola, and then the whole structure rotates through 180 degrees so that the boat is transferred from the top aqueduct down into the bottom basin and then onto the canal. Right. So how much power do you need just to make this change? Well, actually, it's very, very small, equivalent to boiling eight kettles of water. Really? Yes, that's all. It's about one and a half kilowatt hours, yeah. If you're on a canal boat, where are you coming from there where you've got to use this in order to go that way? Well, the, the canal that comes to this end starts in Edinburgh, so from Edinburgh you can come all the way to Falkirk here, through the wheel, and then onto the canal here, which is called the Forth and Clyde, which takes you all the way to Glasgow. The wheel's simple but clever design is based on perfectly balancing the two gondolas that carry the boats. In the days when there were 11 locks here, it would have taken the best part of a day to navigate this section. Now, using the Falkirk wheel, a boat can be through here in just 15 minutes. Amazing. Half a million visitors come here every year. Just here, yes. yes. And when you built this, did you expect it to be a, a tourist attraction? Um, initially, it was a lock replacement. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, when, when, when we realised that people would love to come here, we then developed the visitor centre and then turned it into an attraction with boat rides that people could actually take a journey on. Had the Falkirk Wheel been here 150 years ago, I've no doubt it would have attracted the attention of Francis Frith. It's a striking bit of engineering. It's attracting plenty of sightseers. And like the Stirling Bridge in the Frith photo, I feel quite sure it's going to have its place in Scottish history. So I don't have much choice this time my photo has to be of the Falkirk wheel. Right, well, I'm going to try and get a bit of the old, the canal boat that's in the picture and this wonderful modern structure to show how it's a funny old canal boat, but it needs a fantastically modern structure to move it up and down. It is the old and the modern, I hope, brought together in one picture. The shape of the wheel takes you by surprise, a pleasant surprise, distinctive and challenging. My photograph this time is in sharp contrast to the Frith photograph. That is a bridge that takes you back 500 years. This takes you all the way back to a millennium project. And the contrast, I think, makes the point. Building, building bridges, building structures that move canal boats up and down. It has a kind of fascination, and I think I've got that. If you want to find out more about Britain's first photo album, go to bbc.co.uk, photo album. Next time, I'll be continuing my photographic tour of Frith's Britain and traveling to the northeast of England and to Hartlepool, where things go off with a bang. Oh, terrific. I'll be finding out what lurked in the iron mines of Cleveland. So when you were a miner, how often would you come across a rat? Every day. Every All day. the time. And I'll be taking one of the pictures that I'm particularly proud of.